much. You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Hi there, just a warning that today's episode of True Crime Conversations contains stories about stillbirth, traumatic labour and detailed surgery. If this is a tough one for you, please take care when listening. Margaret Russell had always dreamt of having a big family. At 28 years old, she was already a mother of two when she fell pregnant for a third time. And after finding out it was a boy, she picked a name, Langdon Francis Russell. As her pregnancy progressed, her obstetrician, a man called Dr Graham Stephen Reeves, told her that her baby was doing well, that he would reach somewhere between eight and nine pounds when he was due, a big baby for a woman with such a slight frame. She was assured that Langdon would be fine, but that promise would not only be a lie, it would end the dreams of Margaret Russell's big, happy family. Instead of that promised eight or nine pounds, Langdon had grown to a massive 14 pounds. So when it came time to deliver him after a four hour labor, his head became stuck in the birthing canal and would remain there for more than 40 minutes. Her doctor, the man she'd trusted to deliver her baby safely, never once advised her to opt for a caesarean section. Instead, he yelled at her to shut up and stop screaming as she fought to deliver her son. He pushed on her stomach, trying to force the baby out. Mrs Russell saying she could feel her baby's heartbeat between her legs as he desperately tried to enter the world through her body. As she continued to scream in agony, Dr Reeves shouted at her again, Shut up. Stop fucking screaming. Your baby is dead. Just push. With his leg up on the end of the bed and her baby's head in his hands, Dr Reeves pulled the boy from his mother. The Registry of Births, Deaths and Marriages would register Langdon's arrival into the world, weighing 14 pounds, 4 ounces, measuring 61.5 centimetres long and with a head circumference of 38 centimetres as a stillbirth. On September 11, 1996, the Russell family said goodbye to little Langdon at a funeral service at Castlebrook Cemetery at Rouse Hill. Seven days later, she filed a formal complaint with the Healthcare Complaints Commission. Margaret Russell's experience with Dr Reeves would be one of nine complaints that would eventually lead to him being banned from practising obstetrics in 1997 – Those women who bravely came forward and shared their stories truly believed that they'd stopped a monster from hurting other women. But little did they know, there'd been complaints about his conduct well before they'd shone a light on his behaviour. And there would be even more to come after. Thousands of women were referred to obstetrician and gynaecologist Dr Graham Stephen Reeves, a man who would later be dubbed the Butcher of Bega. I'm Claire Murphy, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In 2011, Gynaecologist Graham Stephen Reeves was sentenced to two and a half years in prison for maliciously inflicting grievous bodily harm on one of his patients. That case was just one of many allegations of heinous offences against his female patients that dated back nearly two decades. Claims of assaults, molestation and mutilation plagued his career from the 90s, following him from hospital to hospital, which led to the New South Wales Medical Board banning Reeves from practising obstetrics in 1997. Despite that, Reeves took a job in 2001 as a specialist obstetrician and gynaecologist for the Greater Southern Area Health Service in Sydney, working unregistered in Bega and Pambula. 
When he was finally struck off the medical register in 2004, a trail of traumatised women were left in his wake, most too embarrassed or mortified to tell their stories. But the ones that did pushed for reform so that no other women would ever go through what they had. Over the next two weeks, we'll be examining the crimes of the butcher of Bega through the eyes of the legal system, as well as his patients. Our guest today, Margaret Cunneen SC, is the Australian barrister, prosecutor and commissioner who prosecuted Graham Reeves in 2008. She joins us now. Margaret, Graham Reeves started his career as an obstetrician and gynaecologist at Sydney's Hornsby Kurungar Hospital just before Christmas 1985. Do we know how long before complaints started to come in about Dr. Reeves back then? Yes, it seems as though he went very well and was well regarded and thought to be kind and proficient for at least a decade. And Interestingly, I had a conversation a few years ago now, but during his first trial with Ray Hadley, the 2GB broadcaster of great renown, who told me that two of his children had been delivered by Dr. Reeves up in that area in the 80s, and that he and his then wife were absolutely thrilled with the births and the way that Dr. Reeves had assisted and delivered the babies. And he was really quite astonished that things could have gone so badly in later years for Graham Reeves. So for about a decade, he's doing well. Do we know what started to happen with Reeves for when these complaints did start to come in in the 90s? Yes. In the mid to late 90s, and certainly in 1996, there was the loss of a patient, of an obstetric patient who died undoubtedly because of Reeves's mistakes, but he was later acquitted of manslaughter by criminal negligence because it's a very high standard. But that patient, Mrs. McAllister, Kerry McAllister, was lost in 1996. Now, I tried to work out what could have gone wrong with him because it had been described to me how he was a person who used to gain an awful lot of weight till he was obese, and then he'd lose an awful lot of weight till he became skinny. And this happened quite a few times, and he was known to have contracted diabetes and other serious physical health problems. And one just has to wonder whether that also took a toll on his mind and on his brain. So it always seemed to me, having heard so many people speak highly of the first part of Dr. Reeves' career, that something must have happened to him to change the way he was. Because you would think that if he was a a narcissistic psychopath, for example, that that would be a condition which always would have been manifest. So I'm prepared to accept in relation to him that his diabetes or some condition which built on that or, or was a result of that may have changed his brain chemistry. You mentioned his patient, Kerry McAllister, who died in 1996. That was just one of the cases that eventually saw Reeves in court facing charges many years later. But at the time, what happened with Dr Reeves and Kerry McAllister? Poor Kerry delivered a child. She was a 38-year-old mum and she started getting a fever. And this was drawn to Dr Reeves' attention by all the nursing staff. And he said to them, I know, I know, uh, she's got a virus. But whether or not poor Kerry had a virus, she also had an advancing bacterial sepsis, which the nurses were afraid of, but the doctor just kept saying, no, it's okay. She doesn't have to be moved to a higher-grade hospital or anything. I can look after this. And he basically just made the errors of, of not treating the bacteria that was killing her. And she just died of the sepsis, having recently been delivered of a new baby, and it was just a terrible tragedy. But the nursing staff saw what was going on, and but were a bit powerless because Graham Reeves was imperious and condescending. I heard a lot to the nursing staff. He knew best and wouldn't respond to their concerns. I understand maybe nursing staff feeling like they couldn't 
do or say anything in that instance, but did any of Dr Reeves's peers ever step in when these concerns were being raised? Not really. It seems that he was always in smaller hospitals where he probably didn't have very much else going on, and that was, of course, particularly the case when he was in the Greater Southern Health District, particularly in the Pambula Hospital and Bega Hospitals. He was only supposed to do gynaecology because fairly unknown to them. He'd been banned from obstetrics, but he still dabbled in it, so to speak, when he was down there. But he was the only women's health specialist that they had. And so there there weren't any peers and somehow he just got away with it. And perhaps also he was trading on that early good reputation that he had, that other doctors thought that he was okay. Now, in that time in the 1990s, he did work at several different hospitals during that period. Were there complaints coming from all of those hospitals at the time and were those complaints consistent? What kind of behaviours were being called out? Well, there are so many complaints about Graham Reeves of so many different natures. That was the staggering thing about this particular person because you might expect incompetence only or malicious cruelty only or sexual misconduct only. But over the years, he was accused of the whole gamut. So not only being really incompetent, but also being very cruel, the way he would conduct gynecological examinations and other examinations, being very rough and being nasty, condescending, and of course, the absolute culmination with Mrs. Carolyn de Wagenaire. I want to come back to Carolyn de Wegener's story in a little bit, but what eventually led to him being banned from obstetrics in 1997? I understand he was still allowed to practice gynaecology after that, but a yes. range of women had come forward at that point with complaints. Some of them had even lost children during labour. Kerry had obviously passed away at this point. Was it their official complaints that saw the medical board take action? It was a general suspicion, really. When one looks back, it was so slow to get anything done about this guy. And there was a wonderful woman called Lorraine Long who ran the medical action group, MEAG, I think it was called, and she's probably still running it. But she was always trying to get something done about him, but it seemed to grind very, very slowly. And perhaps it was because of the range of different things that were alleged The the cases were all different and it wasn't as though there was a consistent repetition of the same type of thing. And so things went to different people and there was an effort, I think, to view things in the best possible light for the medical practitioner. So many women had made complaints of various kinds. but So the obstetrics, though, with the loss of babies and the loss of at least one mother, in pretty obviously terrible circumstances, did lead to the suspension of Dr Reeves's registration in obstetrics. But he was permitted to proceed with gynaecology. Now, he wasn't open with the Southern Area Health Service about that. It wasn't plain. So he still got away with doing some obstetric work when he was down there. And once again, you know, he had the excuse... I recall that, well, someone's got to do it. You can't stand by if you know what to do and, and you don't do it. And, and there, there is certainly an overlap between gynaecology and obstetrics. So just to explain in a layperson's way about the difference between obstetrics and gynaecology, as I understand it, obstetrics is all the medicine to do with delivering babies with your pregnancy and then the birth, be it vaginal or caesarean section, But the overlap with gynaecology, which is everything to do with women's external and internal sex organs, the healthcare in relation to all of those organs is gynaecology. And so obviously the overlap happens when the patient becomes pregnant. So he wasn't honest in relation to the restrictions that he'd had on his practice. In fact, he was also convicted in the trial that I did against him in 2010. 11, of a fraud on the Department of Health for not having included in his application for that appointment that he had been banned from obstetrics. Previous to that ban, Margaret, 
those people that came forward, all those women, I believe there was nine in total who came forward and told their stories to the complaints department, they were told that often the evidence given in their particular cases was not sufficient, that they didn't feel that their particular situation was any major sort of health or safety issue. Reeves never faced any criminal or negligence charges before being barred in 1997, did he? No, no, he didn't. The restriction was a little bit tentative too. It was, you know, we'll just restrict you for a while and see what happens. This may not be the case, but it looks as though the authorities didn't really want to bite the bullet, just didn't want to get into any strife that they could be appealed against, and they were just biding their time, really. And that means that the women who complained were, in effect, being fobbed off largely. And there was a real element of that in relation to quite a few of the women, and probably the idea of, well, who's right about a medical complaint? A patient who doesn't know medical things, doesn't know what it is to be a doctor versus a doctor. And so there didn't seem to be, to me, even when I came into it so many years later in you know, 2010, I suppose, it seemed like when I met many of the women who'd made complaints that they'd been told, well, look, how would you know? This is how we do it. And he's a specialist and he knows best. So after he is banned from practising obstetrics, he is allowed to continue on and be in the clinic for gynaecology. But eventually the midwives there say that they're not going to work with him anymore. This is the year 2000. They say no more with Dr Reeves. Do we know why they started pushing back on him being able to practise gynaecology as well? He was creepy and he was cruel and perhaps not with everyone. I developed the idea that he had a different bedside manner, so to speak, with women depending on whether he liked them, whether they were attractive to him, whether they were bossy with him. If they were attractive, they were at risk of sexual types of misconduct during gynaecological examinations and women could feel an erect penis against their arms and but they were worried that they were imagining it and things like that. Or for some women, if they were sort of rather outspoken women or women who knew their rights and everything, he'd be very cruel in the application of a speculum, for example. And some women have described how rough and terribly painful it was when he examined them and and how it seemed to them that he was enjoying hurting them. And some nurses who worked for him, even though he usually contrived to have them out of the room, but some of these receptionists and everything started to hear just screaming and women leaving in tears. It just wasn't normal at all. It was terrible. But because a lot of these incidents could be explained or or it just hurts that way or no, I didn't, and so on, the women doubted themselves. And, of course, until women started to be appear in numbers and perhaps comparing notes with one another, so much of it must have gone unreported or unnoticed to the authorities. I've seen that in other areas of particularly sexual assault with pedophiles and so forth. If they get away with small things, then they do progress because the power just kicks in and they think that they're invincible and that they will never be brought to justice and that they can just keep advancing, keep increasing their abuse. And that seemed to be the case with him as well. But I've met so many of the women who have suffered. There was always something different, which was very notable to me in some respects, that obviously they're not all saying the same thing because they've talked amongst themselves. But Interestingly, from a legal point of view, it meant that tendency evidence was a bit harder to get up because of the need for things to be quite similar for the alleged misconduct or sexual or other assault to have similar features to it. And there were so many different things that women said that he'd done to them. So after the midwives say that they're going to no longer work with him, he is ejected from that hospital's gynaecological clinic. But then he moves from the north of Sydney 
to the south of Sydney and applies for a job in the Southern Area Health region. And he's given the opportunity to step back into his role. And as you've said, not just in gynecology, but again, starts working in obstetrics. Was nobody checking this doctor's, you know, credentials, whether complaints had been registered against him? Was that not the done process when hiring a doctor in a hospital? There was always the sense that it was a little bit analogous to clergy being moved around, okay, he made a mistake here. Let's hope it doesn't happen somewhere else. Now he's not my problem. Let's hope he's learned his lesson, that type of thing. And so it's very interesting that that phenomenon that we've seen in some of the churches in relation to pedophilia is probably the case too with the medical profession in this type of situation, that it's difficult to prove It's a nuisance. No one wants any more complaints, so move them on. Maybe it's not true. Maybe they won't do it again. Maybe they've learnt the lesson. Someone else will have to pick up the problem somewhere else down the line. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Claire Murphy. I'm speaking with Margaret Mary Carneen SC, the Australian barrister, prosecutor and commissioner who prosecuted Graham Reeves, the butcher of Bega. So pretty quickly, complaints start to happen again when he's practising in the southern region. And then a woman, a 58-year-old widow, Carolyn de Wegener, steps into his office with a small discoloration, a small lesion on her labia, which they later find out is a precancerous lesion. What happens to Carolyn on the operating table? This is something that I can never forget. And I'm still in contact with Carolyn. She's a wonderful lady, English born. She's very matter of fact, very smart, beautifully spoken. And I can imagine that when she goes to this doctor, she's very businesslike and not someone to be trifled with. And I'll just give you my impressions as we go through. I think she's the type of woman who Graham Reeves, by that time in his life, didn't like. He tended to want to put people who thought that they knew or wanted to know as much about him and about their condition, he wanted to put such a woman in her place. He thought she was too much of a smart aleck and he would deal with her. That's what I think happened with Carolyn because I suppose she was coming to me too as a professional in a sense. And and so I know how she was. It was now, what are we going to get out of this now? I want you to do, and she had a certain way of doing things and good for her. Why shouldn't we, when we're dealing with professionals, want to know how they're going to deal with our case, be it legal, medical, architectural, whatever. But she was just that type type of woman. And so many of the women I met were not like that at all. They were very much more meek and mild and, oh, if the doctor says so, well, it must be right. But she's quite outstandingly a woman who speaks up for herself in a very clear fashion. So she went in with this slight discoloration in one labia minora and it was about a centimetre around. It was just a, a white patch, really. And he said, oh, yes, I think I can excise that for you. We'll book you in. He may have taken a small biopsy then and found that it was the VIN-3. It's not life-threatening yet, but it can turn into a cancer that might spread a bit, and certainly it should be excised at an appropriate time. Well, that's what she thought she was going to get, and he drew a diagram for her where he marked on it the location of the lesion and then a little sort of dotted margin around it, which she naturally thought was what would be taken, that the lesion would be taken out and the the sides sewn together and there'd be very little disruption to the area or to her life. Well, she booked in for the procedure and she says, and it was accepted by the jury and right up to the High Court, that as she was going under the anaesthetic, he said to her, I'm going to take your clitoris too. And that's the last thing she knew. When she woke up, 
not only was her clitoris taken and the lesion, her whole labia majora and menorah and clitoris were all removed, were all gone. What was left was sewn up with two openings. It was diabolical and the type of thing that no woman having heard it can ever get out of one's mind. And he said to her later, well, you're a widow, so what? She was 58. At the time, I was younger than that, but now I'm quite a lot older. And I don't think that that's anything that a doctor should say. And it was particularly cruel to say that to that poor woman whose image as a woman was thereafter gone. She explained it so eloquently that she just doesn't feel like a woman at all now. She feels like a nothing. And she was given no choice about that. And quite obviously, if you heard that, knowing what you had, being as intelligent and forthright as she is, you would say, well, if he'd said that he was going to take so much, you would certainly go to someone else to see whether that is, is necessary. During the trial, we heard from many doctors on both sides. And of course, the doctors for the prosecution said all that needed to be taken was the lesion with a margin around it, a safe margin, a margin which would take into account any slight spread of this precancer and that they would biopsy the edges to see that there's nothing that might have gone any further. And then perhaps if there had been any further spread, well, maybe more radical surgery then. But that was what was called for. But it was interesting that some of the old doctors called for the defence, said, oh, that was the way it was always dealt with in the old days that particular thing, no, we used to take the lot, was much safer. And actually it was extremely galling to hear that. It is a fairly rare thing, but it's happened in like in the order of, say, hundreds of times in this country that women have been treated that way for that type of thing on the basis that, oh, well, so what, they're old, who cares, and we might as well take it all now because then there's no trouble in the future. And it's awful to think that the sexual aspect of a woman of any age of her identity and self-worth in that area can just be stripped away by, well, people who were pretty much all male doctors just thinking, oh, so what, she's old, she doesn't need it anymore. To me, it was a, a very interesting look into the history of gynaecology and how to some doctors, once a woman's reproductive life was over, it didn't matter that she didn't have any structural external genitalia. Now, everyone knows that when you go into surgery, you're not alone in a room with a surgeon. There's a team of people that go in with you, nurses, anaesthetists, etc. Did anyone say anything when they noticed that too much was being taken? Of course, everyone at that operation was called in the trial. And the anaesthetist said, I don't know anything about that, so I didn't really look or anything. But the head theatre nurse said she was just shocked and she said, you're not taking all of it. And he said, oh, I have to, I have to. And it just happened. This was an interesting thing. It was called a vulvectomy. And that can mean something excised from the vulva. But Dr. Reeves explained it as, well, I said it was a vulvectomy. That's what I've always called it. When I'm there, I take what I have to take. So Carolyn isn't the only person who's suffered an injustice at the hands of Dr. Reeves. There are other women during this period when he's in the southern region who, again, claim that they've been sexually assaulted, that they have had inappropriate surgeries and some have had complete hysterectomies to rectify the damage that was done to them. But still, at that time, we're talking around 2002, 2003, there's still no criminal charges being laid against Dr. Reeves. That doesn't come until much later in 2008. What changed for the courts to finally get involved with him? It was a wonderful police team. Quite a few really great detectives got hold of it and did a tremendous job investigating and, and putting it up to the, to the DPP. They brought to us 
close to 100 case studies that I looked at all of them. And obviously, you can't run them all together. And so I decided we should start on the most obviously serious case with a live victim and see how we go with that. That was Carolyn. And we did well with that. And then on the basis that perhaps he might plead to other things after that once we have some success. Well, we did succeed with that case because Carolyn was such a credible witness. The offence was so obvious and so serious. And many of the women didn't want to give evidence. They just didn't want to. And they didn't want to be cross-examined. They didn't want to talk about what had happened to them. But a few did. And a couple of other women who did give evidence about what had happened to them too. But some women were prepared to say, and this happens in sexual assault too, some women were prepared to say, well, run those cases and I'm happy to see what happens then and see him get his comeuppance through other people. That's their entitlement to if they don't want to have anything to do with it and don't want to give evidence. So we did start with that. And we had some ideas for other ways of dealing with things, but of course Reeves started to appeal and we had to wait to see what happened in the Court of Criminal Appeal and the High Court. So that chewed up some years. And then by 2017, there was another trial against him in relation to Kerry McAllister. And I wasn't briefed to do that, even though I was still a Crown prosecutor at the time, but I was mainly doing murders then. And another Crown did that case and it didn't succeed. It was a judge alone case before Judge Zara, who's now sadly deceased. But he found that although Graham Reeves had clearly made numerous errors in relation to Kerry McAllister, that it didn't reach that criminal standard manslaughter by criminal negligence, and he acquitted him. And so that was also one of the very strongest cases, I thought. And then the DPP didn't proceed, and, and that was up to the DPP and not me, didn't proceed in relation to any of the other counts. And perhaps one of the things that fed into that decision was that Reeves had many, many health problems. But I note that he's still alive and he's not in jail anymore. He didn't really do that long for for Carolyn Duwagenaire, about two and a half years. And so it's not satisfactory at all. And so many women might feel that they haven't been vindicated in, in this, but at least, at least that man will never work in any medical capacity again. And off the back of Carolyn's case, New South Wales did introduce the strongest legislation in the country to protect patients against misconduct by doctors, passing the Medical Practice Amendment Bill through the New South Wales Parliament. Now, that bill saw a number of changes, including the introduction of mandatory reporting by medical practitioners of their colleagues in instances of serious misconduct and automatic suspensions for doctors who breach certain conditions on their registration. But did that really change anything for patients? Because there was another case of another gynaecologist who in 2016 was found to have done a lot of unnecessary surgeries on the genitals of women over a space of 20 years. And those people had all complained too and nothing had come of it up to that point. Did the Graham Reeves decision actually change anything for women who find themselves in this situation? It's hard to say whether it specifically did, but like so many things affecting women and children and their capacity in the legal system and and against powerful institutions that have oppressed over the years, at least women know that it might be that a doctor is not doing the right thing. So there have been very many more complaints from women in dodgy situations, so to speak, involving chiropractors, dentists, all kinds of medical professionals. And women now know that if they don't feel comfortable, if they feel that there's been some sexual touching or some innuendo or some cruelty, that they're much, much more likely to go to the police now, not hang back and do nothing. You remind me, actually, Claire, that 
in relation to quite a few of these women, and I remember that many of them were from the country when Reeves was down in Bega and Pambula, and they'd be taken to the doctor for their gynecological checkup by a husband or partner, and they'd get into the car and say, I'm a bit worried about that. Reeves really hurt me or he touched me for too long in the wrong place. And so many of the partners, male partners, would say, oh, come on. No, he's a doctor. Come on, you're imagining it. Don't be silly. Oh, oh, I think I should report. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, No, he's all right. He's a doctor. He wouldn't do that. And there wasn't much support for quite a number of those women. It was strange. And and that would just put them off. And, And not only that, it would make them feel like, especially in relation to the touching perhaps for too long or inappropriately, on parts of the genitalia that shouldn't be touched, they'd start to think they were fantasists, really. And so they'd just not go on with it. But that is a thing that is now changing, Claire, as we know, that women do know what is the wrong touching. Women are talking about it. They know what should be done. And, of course, this is the great thing. There's always a nurse, a female nurse generally, I think, or always seems to me that male doctors doing intimate examinations or almost anything. Now, last week I was in hospital getting a hip replacement, but I noticed that even for just having a look at the wound, whatever, there's always a nurse there and doctors make sure that that happens. Whereas Dr. Reeves, when he was a doctor, that was another thing that women patients would notice, that somehow he often he'd contrive, if there was a nurse there, to send her to do something, go and answer the phone or do something like that go and get something and then something would happen. Well, women know that now. We talk more about intimate procedures, gynecological procedures. And so thank goodness it's an area of history that's coming out of the dark ages. Thanks to Margaret for assisting us to tell this story. This episode is the first in a two-part special about the Butcher of Bega. Next week, we'll be joined by a former patient of Graham Reeves, telling her story on the record for the first time. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast, hosted and produced by me, Claire Murphy, with audio design by Scott Stronich and guest booking by Cassie Merritt. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. <laughs> 